This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you are tuned to The Baseline, Kyle Lee Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA first show of 2024. And as we are doing this first show, I am, and I'm glad that we're doing it now because, you know what I'm saying, just like that, my man Shaw is already out like a light. He's like, deuces. Here, bro. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I can't, I can't, I can't leave 2024. <laughs> first trip, first trip of the year already planned, brother. You know he's what already, I mean? But he's that's he's ready to roll. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. But uh, shout out to everybody here on the baseline. Uh, tune in, in with us as always. Uh, yeah. So ch- tapping in here before I take a little, little vacay as well, too. You know, with the wife celebrating five year anniversary. So you know, to all the married folks out there who rock the baseline. That's what's up. Um, I mean, marriage is a beautiful thing, man. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Facts. Not one, not two, not three, <laughs> not four. Not... At least, at least you can, at least you speak in with it with confidence, right? When you made this prediction. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm in, I'm in a good space. I'm because good because, space. We, because we know your wife is, 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 a, is, is, a, is a heat fan, right? So I'm sure when you sat down and you had this conversation, it's like, don't be pulling no LeBron Wade nonsense. <laughs> when we when I'm doing this, we in we get all of this. Yeah, it's for real this time. Yeah, yeah. We get all of this. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, welcome to you and yours, man. And, and as always, man, we appreciate everybody hopping on board with us this week. Great show on tap. My man Shaw and I, you know, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Uh, we're gonna be doing a little discussion of trade wins. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what does that mean? There's certain players. Um, as we start approaching the window, big facts yep. for 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 possible uh, trade trade uh, it, you know trading happening you know the trade deadline and things of that nature. Um, so there's a couple of players that have been you know discussed and bantered about, and so we'll get into that whether or not uh, these trade rumors will blow or are they getting flown. Okay, blown or getting flown um, with some <laughs> of these dudes, um, and then. Um, it's been a while since we did, did this and in, in stuff, man. We we had this segment we call Impress Me. You know, I mean, dudes right now that are just completely like balling out of nowhere and I think have certainly not imp- uh, not only just impressed us, but I think has impressed the NBA community and their team in kind. And I think it's exactly the reason why some of these players have helped elevated their teams, you know, to the levels that they are right now. So we've got an Impress Me team that we will have a, conversation on but as always man we appreciate you and yours for hopping on board be sure to get my man shaw at shaw sports nba get at me at game face lead the show's twitter handle at nba baseline available on all major platforms you know where to find us go to www.baselinenba.com to catch us and all of our previous episodes and as always we appreciate the love and support comments and everything like that um, if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, what's up happy 2024 to you and yours you see the blue and white logo sitting right in the center that is the 19 Media Group family, man. We run these content streets. So be sure to go to www.19mediagroup.com to be able to check us out and the family of great shows that are out there. And just so that people know and real and you know, uh, you know, who've been tuning in with us, man. You know, again, we ended 2023 on a really, really celebratory, great note. Not only are we celebrating, you know, 10 years of, of partnership and us doing this show. But um, we were recently selected as a finalist uh, for the best basketball podcast, uh, thanks to the Sports Pod Group Media uh, uh, Committee and and family. And as always, man, you know we we want to win, um, but we more importantly are just always grateful, you know, to be in a conversation of being able to put the show together um, on a consistent basis that has been elevated in the conversation of being among one of the best basketball podcasts. So we encourage you uh, all to please go to www.sportspodcastgroup.com. Uh, go to the shortlist category, look for 2024 and look for the best basketball podcast. And we ask that you uh, give our show a vote, man. If you've appreciated what we've been doing, what we are doing, what we're going to be doing, uh, we certainly would love for you to go in there, uh, click on, the, back, the, the baseline podcast down in the lower right hand corner when you go to best basketball podcast and give us that vote and as always man we appreciate the love and support man we don't get here unless it's through you um so we want you to continue to keep building with us in this community uh continue to keep uh keep us on our toes you know as we as we purge forward and, and continue to keep delivering the butter goods 
uh, as I used to say, uh, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. All right. So without further ado, Shaw, let's get right into it, man. Trade wins. We're going to be talking about players who rumors are going to either get blown, get blown up, or they're getting flown. They're getting sent elsewhere. And I think one of the hot button players out there right now is for uh, Toronto Raptors, power forward slash center, Pascal Siakam. Um, listen, I know you know it's a foregone conclusion that the talent of Pascal is still somewhere in that conversation is he has another level. He has another gear. Don't know whether or not he'll ever find that continuing to play for the Toronto Raptors. But Shaw, I think we can both agree on if you are the tar- Toronto Raptors, you really have to start thinking about your rebuilding process, especially since you've already gotten rid of Fred Van Fleet. You are finally able to offload OG Ananobi, right? And in return, you're getting a quality player in RJ Barrett, right? And you've got some supplementary pieces. I think you really want to try and test the waters and give opportunity and time and see what the organization can get, you know, from those players. I think if Pascal Siakam is the last piece, I think you definitely have to consider it and think you definitely need to sell high, you know, while the talent um, level and the the clamoring for his height, what he can bring to the table, is in high demand right now in the current NBA climate. Yeah, Toronto's just in the situation where they want to align the rest of the roster to the age, I think, and building around Scotty Barnes. So with, with Barnes basically being seven years younger than Siakam, the timelines don't necessarily exact. And I think the Raptors kind of realize, kind of realize that this isn't a roster that's going to take them to a, another NBA championship in any capacity. However, as you know, as we record, rumors coming out here that Siakam might get an extension because he's really started to pick things up here in the last, you know, 15, 15 days or so. He's really playing good, good basketball, but you could use that to say, well, he's he's boosting his trade value as well. Toronto does not really know where, where it's going just yet as we record here today, but I think, I think and suspect Siakam will ultimately be moved here um, and they try to go in another direction. There are a couple of teams that have been that, that have been mentioned. Uh, Shams reported over over the course of this last week that Sacramento um, has a lot of interest. Uh, Chris Haynes reported that Golden State has emerged as a as a dark dark horse team that has some interest in him as well. Rumors about Miami, rumors about Philadelphia at one point, and the and Atlanta Hawks, who are another team that are kind of in flux, not really sure what they want to do, have also been mentioned as well too. When the season started, I thought Atlanta might have made a lot of sense. Um, as the season has progressed, Atlanta seems to be going in the opposite direction of, of that. So I, I don't know if that's where it might ultimately goes. I think it probably he does land somewhere out west, but for what package and what team, that remains to be determined. Uh, but the mere fact that they're still thinking about extending him is really interesting. And do you want to be tied into Siakam as good as he is? You know, at forty plus million dollars a year, right now he's going to make thirty seven in, in his final year. Um, that's only going to go up. So yes, he's a twenty point per game guy. Uh, but does he stunt the growth ultimately of Scotty Barnes and then even RJ Barrett, if that's who you traded, you traded OJ Ananobi for, you know, what are you expecting out of those guys? Any manual quickly, who I think a lot of people are saying has Tyrese Maxi ish talent, if given the opportunity. So the Siakam get in the way of that, or can he play alongside that? All those, all those questions remain to be answered. Yeah. Listen, if you're the Toronto Raptors right now, you cannot find a better window of opportunity for yourself. Um, for you really to consider this 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 idea about possibly moving him, you know there are several teams Shaw um, that I think have access to wanting a player like like Siakam, and I think the question just comes down to are you just willing to pull the trigger? Um, and I think it puts some of these GMs in a tenable position when you think about that because if they don't pull the trigger, then it clearly means that they have a mindset of what what they believe that the team should look like and the expectations of that being successful because they, they should be, you know, participating in the playoffs. Right. So when you talk about teams like the golden state warriors, it is quite obvious that if you have a certain system, um, like what Steve Kerr has, but the players that you're utilizing are not able to execute that system effectively, whether you're siding with your star players or not, whatever the case may be, wherever you are with your GM, 
I would think you have to kind of kick that tire around and see, can this person really augment, offset a lot of the deficiencies that this quote unquote system that the coaches implemented are wanting to see come out happening, you know, and, and look, it's, this is the, the question here is how many other players like a Pascal Siakam are available to be able to help bolster what your team is going to give you and afford to do. If hmm. there are a plethora of other players out there, then I would say, yeah, you know, you don't necessarily have to do it. Maybe you can get, you know what I'm saying? Um, a, 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 a lesser version of a, of a Pascal Siakam type to, to, to do those things. But I really do think that if you're a competitive basketball team and you have pieces that are more questionable than more ironclad, then I really think you have to you have to explore, you know, that 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 situation. I think it's it's how Siakam is ultimately casted, right? So you look at where he was the most successful when they won an NBA championship, and he was basically the the third banana, if you will. Um, he's one, two, wherever, however you want to call it in Toronto right now. And I think that's where you're limiting your success. In a place like Sacramento, he's probably third banana again behind Fox and Sabonis. And while Sabonis isn't a volume scorer, he's you know he's a scorer in the range of, of Siakam, you know the twenty-ish to twenty-two type type of game. Uh, I don't know though from a size standpoint because that's where Sacramento really struggled um, at certain points in the rebounding. Siakam is a decent rebounder, but not necessarily a plus rebounder. So it, it's an interesting right. fit. I think they're just looking at it from a talent standpoint. You, you know, do you get off of Keegan Murray to to, to bring Siakam there? The contract of Harrison Barnes probably has to be involved in that from a veteran side and also just to kind of match some money. Um, so the the things there don't really make don't line up for me immediately. But I understand why Sacramento wants to just kind of get into the space where they're trying to put accelerant on their their overall success. The team that hasn't been mentioned that makes a lot of sense to me, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it really quickly, is Dallas. To me, you know, Grant Williams um has been all right. Uh, but hasn't really done the job that I, I think like they were it. hoping. All right. Right. <laughs> like you struggled so to put that up. <laughs> I think Siakam alongside, uh, you know, you, you, you continue to develop a guy like, you know, Derek Lively at, at that center position. You still have uh, Powell and, and, and players like that. I think he could pretty much be what Dallas needs in that sense to kind of get them into that next tier. Uh, but again, if he goes to Sacramento or if he were to go into to Golden State, um, I can understand why either one of those teams that would do it. The last thing I'll say about it really quickly is before you give your thoughts on Dallas is because we don't, we're not sure what direction Atlanta wants to go. I just don't know how they're in this conversation because Atlanta's thinking about selling off parts. So what are you doing if you're acquiring Siakam? I would have but to assume it's they're trying to offload, you still have Trey Young there too, right? I'd have to assume they're trying to offload Capella, right? I mean, but do you want Siakam to be your small ball five, or you you do do you open up the, really, the, the that really, space for a Kongwu? I understand, so, but does it really matter? I mean, because I, uh, go ahead. well, well, well. I mean, at the end of the day, Atlanta is is to me probably the biggest wild card in the situation because you just don't know what direction they're teetering on. We'll talk about them in a minute. But Dejounte is up for potential trade. Sadiq Bey is up for potential trade. Capella is always in trade rumors. So, what exactly direction is Atlanta trying to go? Knowing that Trey Young also air quotes wants to win. So to me, it's, it's very, very convoluted when you think about some of the teams that are sniffing around Siakam and then understanding what role you want Siakam to ultimately play for that new roster. Well, okay. So it's interesting because when I think about the Atlanta Hawks, I believe that they are a mirrored image in a way of the Dallas Mavericks only in that you have two dynamic guards and yet where your team really suffers is on your front court play. You don't have consistency from your front. Now, now, look, if you compared the rosters and you look at the way that these teams play, it's kind of hard to imagine why the Atlanta Hawks have been struggling as much as they've been struggling. Like Sadiq Day, Sadiq Day's putting up decent numbers. But if you ask me and you made the comparison of, say, like the Dallas Mavericks, I mean, look what they're getting from Dante Exum, from Tim Hardaway Jr., right? And from Derek Lively. And you put those numbers up and they're not, you know, in the same level of comparison of what you're getting from Clint Capella and from uh, from Sadiq Bay, so I think there's clearly something in the, the 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 chemistry, the way that the team flows with that type of roster. So to your point, Shaw, do I think Pascal Siakam is a good fit for the Dallas Mavericks? I would say yes, because if you're down on Grant Williams, you um, you know Dante Exum has been really good, but you're not going to rely on that. Again, 
this is more of a backcourt heavy type roster. They really have nothing in the front court, even while they are developing Derek Lively. So an approved player like Pascal Siakam, I think his presence and I think his contributions will be so much more significant to the Dallas Mavericks than I would see with the Atlanta Fal uh, with the Atlanta. So I'm about to say Falcons with the Atlanta Hawks. Here's the interesting part, though. If you are the Toronto Raptors, what kind of package do you think would be better fit for them to consider? Whatever is coming from the Dallas Mavericks or whatever would be coming from the Atlanta Hawks? Because I think that there's more attractive attractive pieces to give to the Toronto Raptors to get a guy like Pascal Siakam with the Atlanta Hawks. doesn't mean that I think that Siakam going to the Atlanta Hawks is better. But I agree with yeah. you in the sense that with, with the Dallas Mavericks, they would sorely need a guy like that who I think can bolster that team's front court presence, rebounding, scoring, consistency. He won't be the greatest uh, defensive uh, replacements for this team, but definitely, but he's definitely 10 steps ahead of where this Dallas Mavericks team was. They suffer defending the basketball. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a, it's a great question because Toronto has a weird roster as, as even as currently constructed. Oh. So I think when you're looking what pieces you're trying to bring back is are you bringing back Siakam's actual replacement to build upon, or are you moving Scotty Barnes into a four ish role when he's been playing point guard two and three, you know, all season long. So it's, it's a really, really interesting test taste case study here on the Raptors. But I agree with you wholeheartedly that I think Atlanta on at face value has a better package of players to, because if they could get off of the Andre Hunter, if you don't believe in the guy we'll talk about later on, but you know, Jalen Johnson is somebody who thinks is, is emerging that, Hey, maybe you'd want, want to take a flyer there on that too. In addition, I mean, you don't want Capella and Yaka Pirtle together, um, but there's just other players there. I think that are, that speak to what Toronto may ultimately want if they wanted to make a move there from, from Atlanta. Um, whereas you're looking at the, the Mavericks and Grant Williams probably has to go in that after January 15th, would you trade, Tim Hardaway Jr. To, to match salaries, but he's been your sixth man of the year. Josh Green, Jaden Harvey, like prospect guys, but they, do they get in the way of RJ Barrett? So to me, I agree 1000%. Atlanta has a better package if that were to go. But ultimately, you know, the last team I'll discuss on this and we'll move on from Siakam is if Golden State does get into this, then are you asking for the Moody's and the Kamingas, you know, back? If you're if you're Toronto, and I'd say that's that's kind of what it has to take in essence to try to to move that uh, to to Golden State specifically because you'd want to make sure that you're getting talent that at least seems to be on the upswing here as opposed to some of those other guys that are mentioned. You're tuned to the baseline, Cali Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA in our conversation. Trade wins are this uh, are the rumors getting blown or is that are those players possibly getting flown? Hey. Are you looking for the ultimate destination for NBA gear? Then you look no further than with the NBA store. With a huge selection of authentic and high-quality products, including jerseys, hats, and accessories, the NBA store has everything you need to show off your team pride. Plus, with exclusive and limited edition items, you can make your collection truly one of a kind. With an online presence, you can shop from anywhere in the world. Don't miss out on the latest trends and experiences. Visit the NBA store today by clicking our affiliate link. If you're listening to us on your favorite audio platform, be sure to check the link in the description of the show. The baseline is working in affiliation with the NBA store slash fanatics and will be compensated for your patronage by utilizing our link. And as always, we thank you for your support. Be sure to go to nbastore.vwz6.net slash baseline when you get that product you are also supporting the show all right so let's go ahead y'all um let's talk about since we were on the conversation about the atlanta hawks with deontay murray and sadiq bay you know it's interesting because i think a lot of people were excited about the combination of trey young and deontay murray Listen, DeJounte. DeJounte, all right so Dejounte. um why is he so attractive show i don't understand yeah, I mean, just because he's a guy, at least in theory, that uh, can play both ways. He can score the basketball, obviously, and defend, gets a decent amount of steals. Some of those numbers have been antiquated or not as, as heavy in Atlanta because they play a little bit of a different style when he was kind of the man in, in San Antonio. Um, but people say, listen, as a third player on, on our roster, our third best player, you know, that's a high, not high level talent. And there's some interest in what he can do, especially from the play creation side and, and then defense if he's more locked in and engaged. Atlanta. Um, they they're scoring a bunch of points right now. Um, not really playing a whole lot of defense. So again, he's kind of put that in his back pocket, 
but I think teams kind of remember what he was what he was in San Antonio and feel like, you know what, that'd be a great piece for us as a two-way, two-way guy who can kind of just fit in um and 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 really guard, you know, one through three, I think, in a lot of ways, but also do some play creation as well, too. So that's why you see the Lakers, you know, just clamoring for for the possibility. Also, the clutch relationship between he, he and LeBron, AD, et cetera, et cetera, that plays into it. But DeJounte does have a lot of interest, you know, for some teams out there, um, especially trying to make a splash at the at the at the at the front court, sorry, backcourt position. So you like him with the Los Angeles Lakers if the last if the Lakers were to able or would be able to package or, or pull the trigger on being able to bring him over. I mean, as always, it depends what what you give up, right? But I think Gabe Vincent, because of the injuries, hasn't hasn't really worked out. Your guy D'Lo. Um, First of all, listen, you add you you add uh, Dejounte Murray on that team. They are significantly a better offensive team, right? But I, I I I guess part of my struggle with this team is the fact that even if you're saying you bring him over and he's he's a he's a better player for what they currently have as as the roster goes, I, I still don't understand the identity of the Los Angeles Lakers because they're not. They're they're not showing you that they're great defensively either. They're decent, they they but they have not been as good as they've been over the last yeah. few years, right? So, and and to your point, you just mentioned it earlier. You say, look, he's kind of put his defense in the back pocket because he's become more of an offensively forward player. You know, I don't want to say offensive mind. I think he's an offensive forward player. I don't know if it's because of playing next to Trey Young, or because of Quinn Snyder's style of, of play that he's trying to get the Atlanta Hawks to play. I just wonder if whether or not he's able to get back to being the kind of player that he was in San Antonio, where, you know, we talk about two way in that kind of, and this is the reason why I said Shaw that the, 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 the quote unquote two way player, that moniker, I feel like is becoming a die. It's a dying thing. I, 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 I'm starting to see lesser and lesser of the emphasis on two way play per se at that position, that shooting guard position that was elevated by the likes of the Clay Thompsons and the Kawhi Leonard's and the Paul George's, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like that has shifted. And so if he is still part of that elk, so to speak, is that what the expectations are going to be if the Lakers were to pull that trigger? And is it worth giving up the capital they'll probably have to give in order to bring that kind of player to that top, to that roster? Uh, uh, I any- think you like, you're, but you're just looking at ways in essence to uh, take some pressure off LeBron in terms of the play creation, because with all the changing lineups that have happened here now, D'Lo to the bench, uh, LeBron has more or less become, and maybe he always was kind of the, the de facto point guard, but, but Gabe Vincent being injured all year, that also just put more play, more pressure on him from a play creation. The only, the best, next best person is Austin Reeves. And he can do it, but it's not something that I think you want it. You want it as a complementary role, not as necessarily the primary role for either one of those guys, especially at the stage of LeBron's career. And then just even what Reeves' ultimate skill set is. Again, secondary playmaking, awesome, but not your primary guy. So DeJounte, as a guy, comes in who, at least in his last year in San Antonio, averaged nine assists a game, you know, was slowly climbing. He got to Atlanta, and because Trey is so ball dominant, well, those assists dropped all the way back down to four and five. But I think, you know, in an, in an L.A. system, especially with LeBron and A.D. on the wings or on the post, or whatever you need to do, you'd see those numbers get back probably up in the seven to eight range. So I understand why the Lakers have interest. It's interesting to know, though, Philadelphia might have some interest, which is a little little bizarre, uh, only from the aspect because you think Maxi is doing so well, doing both the play creation and, and scoring for himself. So I don't know how that would make sense if that were to ultimately come fruition. And as always, you know, Miami and teams like that are, are sniffing around as well, too. But I think if DeJounte gets moved, it's most likely going to be through the clutch situation to the Lakers. But for what package? You know, Rui Hachimura. I don't think the Lakers would move Austin Reeves, you know, in a DeJounte deal. Uh, but Hachimura, Torian Prince, guys like that and some draft capital, maybe that makes it work. And D'Lo probably as well. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Shaw, and and I and I want to make sure that we are able to cover Sadiq Bay real quick, um, and the rest of the other um, guys we have listed for our trade win segment. But the one thing that I think I wonder about with Deont- Dejounte Murray's gameplay is is he someone that is effective without the ball? Right. So, in other words, you know, we've seen certain players like Rip Hamilton who elevated their 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 game movement without the ball. Trey Young is ball dominant, 
But the reason why I grew tired of people trying to make the comparisons of him and Steph Curry is Steph Curry has proven to be a much more effective player when he moves without the basketball. That is why he is the MVP level. We just don't see that nearly as often with Trey Young. Trey Young has to have the ball to literally be an effective player. Now, his numbers are adequate, but you can clearly see he's someone, if he added that element to his game, I think that, that the Hawks as a team collectively would be so much better because of his ability to score. If that is on, say, DeJounte Murray to be able to do that, you move him somewhere else. My question is, what exactly are you getting back for that guy? You want him to be the ball controlling type guard that he was when he had those responsibilities in San Antonio? Or do you want him to be the offset guard, shooting guard type player that he has now become with the Atlanta Hawks? Because again, part of this is his ability to mm -hmm. score without having the basketball in his hands. Well, I mean, yeah, he can slash. He can beat some of his some some people off the dribble. Um, but he's become a decent three point shooter, um, up to thirty eight percent this year, and that's with Trey Young more or less setting him up. So I don't know how many how many of those are in catch and shoot situations, you know, right now. But at thirty eight percent, that's pretty good. And you know, he's in a space where he is secondary and not having to do a lot of play creation. So. I think the Lakers would want him to be more the San Antonio guy where the ball is in his hands a lot um, and creating for others, uh, almost like a, what they thought or hoped Russ could have been for them, uh, you know, thinking in, in, in that ilk. Uh, but if he goes anywhere else, then that, that changes the dynamic, especially if it's Philadelphia. I, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not as sold on that, that aspect as I would be of him going over to the West coast and the Lakers. Absolutely. All right, Sean, really quick, Sadiq Bay. Is there an appetite for him, um, you know, with other teams? Or if you're the Atlanta Hawks and, you know, given what you gave up to get him and what he really is giving, because he'd be still a foundational uh, foundational piece. Yeah, just, be, well, I don't know how much a foundational piece because they didn't extend his contract, right? They had they could have done that, you know, earlier. So he's basically playing on the last year of his rookie scale. And yeah, he has a 50 ball in, in his career. And didn't do that necessarily with Atlanta, did that in his years in Detroit. Um, capable three-point shooter, um, but he's going to be looking for his next deal. So can you move off of that before you actually have to pay him? And I think there was some hesitancy on that because they probably wanted to see how guys like Jalen Johnson would develop. What do they get out of the Andre Hunter? So they acquired him last year, which I still thought was a little bit of a, a bizarre move. And I don't know that he hasn't played bad, but I just don't know that the roster fits for what his talent set is with all the other guys that they have. So other teams, especially uh, playoff contending teams, looking for a bench score specifically, uh, might really be interested. You know, I'm going to do a, the shameless plug here. The Celtics have a lot of interest, apparently, according to you know my guy Gary Washburn, who just did the Celtics show with him, and he's a guy who I think could potentially make some sense for Boston um, at a salary because right now he's still on that rookie scale. But knowing that, then you trade for him, you get the bird rice, and you'll probably end up having to extend him. Uh, but I could see him in a place like Boston for sure. Um, Excuse me. Um, and if he wanted to go over into the West, I, I, maybe Houston can utilize some more firepower off that bench if they wanted to try to do something. But they also have a lot of young guys, too, in that team that they're trying to develop. But I think there'll be somewhat of a market for Bay, but I don't know that he I, I wouldn't say he's less likely to get moved than maybe a DeJounte or some of the other guys we're talking about here today. All right. Sounds good. You're tuned to the baseline. Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA coming up. we got a couple more players that we're going to uh, have this conversation with about trade wins. And then do not go too far away either, man. We've got our impress me team. We got some players that we want you to make sure you keep your eye on, you know, as you continue watching this exciting NBA season, more baseline. Don't go away. We're back, Callie Warren Shaw, Baseline NBA Podcast. As we continue our conversation, trade wins. Are the trade rumors getting blown or the players getting flown? All right, so it's interesting, Shaw. We've talked about the Raptors. We've talked about the Pistons. And it wasn't too long ago, you know, there was conversation about pillaging the Chicago Bulls roster. And yet, the only person whose name now is, is come up 
and still remains in the conversation, Zach Levine. Um, and rightfully so. I, 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 you know, listen, the, 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 the combination of him and DeMar DeRozan, I think, and, you know, um, Vucevic, I think is, is, is kind of worn its course, right? Um, so if there's, I guess, a tr an attractable piece out of the three, you could probably say, okay, what could we get with, or what will we have to give up for a guy like a Zach Levine? I got to tell you so. I, you know, like it's interesting because for the longest time we have tried to, you know, put Zach Levine in a particular box. And I think it's brought us to this point about what teams are really getting from the that type of player. So what are we, what would you be getting, right? Shaw, like what, what is it that makes him at this point, again, so attractive, you know, for another team, you know what I'm saying, to break their bank, so to speak to give up some goods in order to bring him onto their roster. I think if you're a team that is truly, truly struggling for a secondary scorer um, at, at an elite level, then you're looking at him as a potential option. But knowing that he has had some issues and some run-ins with some coaches based on whatever his role and perceived role was supposed to be, it will be what I'm going to be watching for in the next few weeks here is how he returns. Cause he is now back from injury. He came off the bench um, and understands that the Bulls have been playing better without him. So it's it's very sobering, I think, you know, as a player to 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 recognize like, wow, look how much better they are when I'm not here. So do you come back in here with the same attitude and same ways and disrupt that chemistry, especially if you're trying to get moved? So to me, whether or not he ends up or stays in Chicago or, or ultimately moves, his attitude and how he matriculates within the current system is going to be the determinative factor for, for either one of those things. Chicago now has more cards on the deck because there wasn't really much of a market for him. So do you say, well, listen, bro, we've been fine. What are they were? They were like 10 and five or something like that without him. Listen, you may stay in this bench role right now because we, we're kind of cooking. Or is it, or is it just, he's just too big of a person where that can't be the case. I ultimately think he's going to find his way back in the starting lineup. I don't think they bring him off the bench in any capacity, but can he build his trade value? So all to guess what you're getting, you're getting a guy who has had some issues with some coaches, but you're a high level talent who can score, like especially shoot the three has some clutch capability and playmaking as well too. I um, mean, if you can find that within your roster, um, then good. I don't see that as a, an elite team right now, it's going to be one of those middle of the pack teams that's trying to make, you know, that next splash or maybe trading one disgruntled superstar for another. And I don't really know how many of the names are out there like that currently. This is tough, man. It, it, it's, it's really interesting because he is a very much, he's, he's definitely a capable scorer. I think the question becomes, and I think you brought it up earlier. Do you see him being a role contributor to scoring the basketball? Right. Can he accept the fact that he may not be the primary go-to kind of guy? How many teams right now are in a position, unless they are a team that is struggling, um, that really doesn't have much of an identity? That means you're going in there to help create or build that identity. Right. You know what I mean? So it's a very interesting space you know, for a guy like Zach Levine. I think if you were the Chicago Bulls and it really mattered about what you wanted to do with him, you should have moved – Zach Levine a whole lot earlier. But if the Chicago Bulls have this under control and Zach Levine is completely fine with where things are, I don't think anything can be done for him. I I, th I feel like if something has not happened at this point, it's going to be hard pressed that it's necessary that teams do need to pull the trigger because again, for what he brings to the table, a lot of those teams that would want his presence have to go in with the understanding that it's not so that he is elevating their front line, uh, their starting roster. It's he's elevating their second unit. He's he's elevating, you know, those 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 uh, those well, analytical numbers. Well, on let, let me only interrupt in the aspect is like I think because when, when we talk about trades, right, we often think about oh well, this guy's got to get to a better situation in a winning situation. I don't necessarily know that Chicago feels that way and has that level of loyalty to, to Zach. He may balk at the idea, but that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, a, it's a middle of the pack team, or it might be a bad team. Listen, if you told right. me right now, I'm going to throw this out there. And like, and again, we're, we're not aggregators or we, you know, we're not plugged into the league we're, we're not breaking news. But if you told me right now, the wizards were like, you know what? 
we regret this Jordan Poole thing. Give us Zach, and we'll give you Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole goes back to a more natural bench scoring role um, in, in Chicago, and whatever that looks like is what it looks like. Zach and Kyle Kuzma can, can kind of cook in Washington. I could see something like that kind of coming to fruition. If you were to say San Antonio wanted to take on Zach Levine as a reclamation project and, and you know, not put fast track, not fast track it, but give them another capable scorer alongside Wemby, I could see that. But those are not winning right. situations. Detroit, you know, they trade their million wings and guards and people who don't are du duplicitous, <laughs> you know what I mean? And get Zach Levine there. It's like, okay, Cade and Zach as building blocks, that could make some sense. I don't think Zach is going to some situation where he's ultimately now going to be the per the player that gets them over the proverbial top. Hence why Philadelphia is not interested. Hence why Golden State kicked the tires, but is not interested. The Knicks kicked the tires, but are no longer interested because they just got OG Ananobi. So to me, it's just, it's, we don't have to say he's going to go somewhere where he's going to make that team a, a title contender right now. It's, Hey, he might end up going to a bad team where he can just get his shots off. Right. And, and, and again, I'm flipping that on not just what you just on how you just put it, Shaw, from the organization uh, executive standpoint. I'm talking about from the player standpoint in this case, mm -hmm. Zach Levine, because I think that's what that comes down to. I think Zach Levine, I don't think we often have a conversation. I don't want to get off track, but I don't think we have enough of a conversation at times where we're thinking about what is the player thinking about? How is he view the landscape of what the NBA is? And I'm not talking about this conversation that you have between your agents. I'm saying as a player and the legacy that you want to leave or whatever your, your personal goals are in having what's considered as a successful season. Well, I'm going to throw this out here, but you know, and we'll move off of, of the Levine conversation, but if you're Memphis, would you, would you look to maybe add him as a, as a third scorer, if you will, is it is it too much? Is, is, would it be too much? But he's a guy who can give you three point shooting. Um, so you pair him alongside uh, a a combination of Morant, Bain, and, and Levine, and even Jaron Jackson. It's pretty 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 sick. Um, and I don't know what it cost you ultimately to get kind of get something like that done, but I think it would give Memphis um, an opportunity to get some more outside scoring and Morant specifically more uh, another target out there to kick when he's driving to the basket. You know, again, a team right now, that's not as good as, as they hope to be, but maybe they can make a move for a guy like Zach and it might make some sense where it wouldn't hurt the development of some of the other, like, other guys there. What do you think about something like that? I like it. I, I, I like it. I like the, the idea or the premise of it. It is there enough work. ball to go around though? Because Jackson is trying to obviously score the basketball. Bain can score and Morant obviously, you know, 20 point per game guy. So you're looking at four players trying to average 20 a game. It's it's a little tough. But anyway, I, I think it's it's probably miscasting him because he's he's obviously a 20, even at at, at best a 25 to 26 point per game guy. At mm -hmm. worst, you know, a 21 point per game guy in, in Zach Levine. Um, and I don't know if that would be the right fit for him, but that's why I think some of those other teams that don't have um, the requisite culture established right now and that are really struggling, Washington, San Antonio, et cetera, uh, they would make a better fit than some of maybe some of these other teams that are being discussed. One thing that I think is interesting too, and I don't know, again, we, we, we'd have to think about what the longevity factor is for a guy like Zach Levine um, is, is he willing to play with teams that have, that play with a faster pace, right? Like, you know, you will get that with the Memphis Grizzlies once John ja Morant is fully, you know, up to John Morant. Like right now he's, you know, he's been gone for a quarter of a season, like really over, almost half a season, right? If you extend it all the way back to, to last year. So if he's really at full tilt, we could be completely talking about a completely different look of how this Memphis Grizzlies team looks to score the basketball, their athleticism. I would not, I would be remiss in saying, have we, have we just decided to kind of throw away the fact that Zach Levine was one of the most athletic you know, above the rim type players, and that maybe in some way for his relevancy to, to 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 be there, they have to play with a tempo that allows him to get out there in open space and be able to, you know, because the, his game has been confined to a half court style type of game since playing with the Chicago Bulls. Not to say that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's it's really forced him to shoot the three better, to be able to be a better, you know, kind of perimeter shooter, learn how to play ISO ball a little bit better. But I do think that his best game has always been where he's been able to get out open in space, where he's been able to move, you know, without the ball and to get above the rim at times. Sometimes you need someone to help you get there. And someone like a John Morant, I think can do that. But again, 
that's just pie in the sky for me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I think because he can play the two or the three, it, it opens up some opportunities. And if you wanted to, again, I think Dallas could get into that conversation if they wanted to, but those are three really interesting personalities kind of put together. So, um, but right now there's not much of a market for Zach, unfortunately, despite his talent level. So we'll see how he acquiesces to the, to the role here coming back in Chicago as they've done better without him. Absolutely. And I think th as well too, Shaw, the fact that there are a lot of players playing his position at a high level has downgraded that appetite for going after a Zach Levine, meaning that there's either an upside from some of the role players or from the players that they've drafted or brought up where from wherever that are playing that role position or whatever the case may be that they just don't see as like, what am I giving up in order to possibly still wait a little bit longer to see what this player that I already have on my roster is willing to give me. I think right now, until that kind of dies down or evens itself out, Zach Levine's, you know, yeah. uh, trade wins <laughs> are, are possibly getting blown. <laughs> okay. All right. Finally, Shaw, John Collins, right, for the uh, San Antonio Spurs. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Utah Jazz. I, 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 John Collins, Zach Collins, I don't know. They, 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 they're playing like a Collins right now. So, uh, and, and right about now, I, I need a little Phil Collins. <laughs> <laughs> with, with what's going on. But with John Collins, though, you know, we were talking about this before we jumped on and started recording, recording the show. It just it doesn't seem like people are completely enamored with him out there in Utah. And it's much less the same thing. I don't I don't understand it, man, because the guy is really, you know, he's a quality player, Um, but it just doesn't seem to translate into what should be, you know, um, the kind of numbers that I guess – gives the organization or the team he's playing with a level of confidence that they will, you know, continue to move forward. So the fact that he's now out there again, you know, in trade rumors seems a little disappointing, but at the same time, I don't know if it's necessarily surprising. Yeah. He's not having a bad season, you know, 14 and eight, roughly um, shooting 37% from three, 47 from the floor. He's, he's been decent. At the end of the day, the move was a flyer, but I didn't understand the flyer because, well, you're just crowding that front court position. When you have a guy like Walker Kessler, not say that you're building Walker Kessler, you're clearly building Ron Markin in, but you just added something else into that to get into Kessler's development. I I just didn't understand it to begin with. And Markin in, while he's played some three, he's better at the four position. So to me, with Kelly Olynyk there as well, too, the, the addition of Khan's flyer or not was kind of ridiculous. Now, I think at the end of the day, it's like, well, they're going to try to see, well, because it didn't cost them much, can they extrapolate that now and maybe get something considerate um, for his for his services? But I think the rumors are out there that, like, hey, he doesn't really fit. But, I, again, he hasn't had a bad season. So I just don't know a situation where he can go and plug and play immediately. That's not even necessarily a bench role. And I don't know that that's what he wants for, for himself. But where are you putting him, um, you know, for a team that might be willing to pay? Where they really want him to kind of be and 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 be within their starting lineup and be their third or fourth option. I, I don't know that that currently exists right now, but Utah is definitely going to kick the tires on it, and I think it's going to speak to some other things too. Because I've been really perplexed with how they've handled that front court position this year. Uh, they they're a pretty deep team in, in all things considered for what is a bad team, if you will. Um, well, a, you know, average team, I guess at best. Uh, but to me, college doesn't fit with what they have going on right now, and definitely not in for the future. Yeah, I think that if you are the Utah Jazz, you really should figure out a way to be able to move. But the problem is, Shaw, we've talked about a few other players right now that I think will take more precedent over a guy like John Collins. You know, it, there's there's oh, nothing. The price, <laughs> it, yeah, but there's nothing that there's nothing about his numbers and what he's currently doing over in Utah that is overwhelming him, overwhelmingly making him, you know, like top of the food chain. You know, what is it going to take in order to get him? You know what I mean? Everything is everything else about what you're doing if you're trying to get a John Collins seems to be ancillary, secondary. Mm -hmm. You know, not not much of the priority of. You know, is he really changing the dynamic? Is he you know, is he swaying? <laughs> you know, what I'm saying the complex. It's not happening like that. And again, his role, his position, how he plays. Again, there are other guys right now who are arguably doing things that could kind of like way down this, you know, this, this bum rush that probably could have happened if he didn't get moved to the Utah jazz via through the Atlanta Hawks. You know, it's one of those things where like that initial trade sounded like, Oh, you say to yourself, damn, I'm finally glad it happened. 
And then now you say to yourself, man, I wish he kind of waited. A li- I wish that, you know, he stayed with the Atlanta Hawks just a little bit longer because there'd probably be some meat on the bone for us to have the conversation about John Collins getting moved because it had to, it would have been for something more, you know, yeah. because now what he's doing in Utah, I'm like, okay, if he gets moved again, this is more the indictment on Collins than it really is about whether or not teams really need a Collins. You know what I'm saying? Because nothing about what Collins is doing is like leaps and bounds elevating you know what I'm saying? The conversation about the desire to get him, not in the same way as the other players that we just talked about. But the fact that his name is out there does speak to some things about one, what the Utah Jazz may be looking to do, and two, about what other teams really probably desperately want and need if they're going to go out of their way to try and get him. Yeah. Again, I'll just say Utah needs to clear the deck, I think, for yeah. some of the other players that are there. And Collins is just kind of in the way. Not not a bad basketball player in any capacity, but that 13 and seven isn't really doing much for them. They can get that production elsewhere. So exactly. I can understand why they'd want to get other assets, draft, draft capital or whatever that may look like. But where does he plug and play immediately? And there's not there's not a team that where that really seems to make a whole lot of sense. Again, unless it's specifically more in a bench role, as I alluded to before. And I don't know how happy that'd make him. So we'll see. I've never let's put it like this, Shaw. I don't know if I'm ever gonna see an organization or a team want to shop as hard as the Utah Jazz will probably try to shop and move John Collins. Not because they, they hate him, but because they know we got to, we got to, we got to make something happen because ain't nobody going to make it happen for us. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's well, kind you, of, like a, said, you, you make the move and then sometimes that happens and you feel like, Hey, well, we got him for cheap and then we'll probably be able to flip him for more than we paid ultimately. And you just, you never know what the trade market is going to bear. And then you have Danny Ainge as the executive in that space. Who's a, a notorious, you know, he's a notorious extractor of, you know, hard deals. So I think when you couple those things together, Ainge himself may have to say, all right, listen, <laughs> Collins is Collins is solid, but I'm not going to get back some sort of haul that I've gotten back in other deals. I think that's where expectations have to come into play here on what they ultimately decide with John Collins. Uh, look, man, Danny Ainge going to need to get him the clips, man. Add him, add him onto his, <laughs> into his executive team, man. That re-up, don't, no, don't nobody re-up like the clips. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying when cats when cats in the in, in the NBA uh, ethos be talking about we got it for cheap. I'm like y'all not listening to the clips right now, bro. <laughs> y'all need to listen to the clips to get it for cheap. You know what I mean? So real cheap. <laughs> shout out to the clips, man. Shout out, shout out to that team, man. One of the one of the great hip hop groups of our generation. All right, coming up, we're gonna uh, end things off nicely with the impress me team. My man, Sean, and I are gonna quickly go over some guys that you should be putting on your radar if you haven't already added them onto your fantasy roster. And if you if, if you're waiting too long, they're probably gone. So, you know, shame on you. But this is the impress me team. These dudes are balling out and you really need to be paying attention to them because they could probably be the difference between your team if they're on your roster, uh, uh, getting that getting them to either conference finals, possibly NBA finals. So you don't want to miss out here on the baseline. We are back. Cali Warren Shaw, Baseline NBA podcast. Hey, are you ready to step up your style game without compromising the planet? Introducing an exciting partnership between Blue View Footwear and 19 Media Group Network. Blue View Footwear is renowned for the world's first fully biodegradable and durable sneaker to lead a revolution in cleaner materials and manufacturing. They offer a sleek and contemporary styles that cater to a wide range of tastes. Blue View has fully revolutionized the footwear industry. Their innovative plant-based sneakers are constructed of 100% biodegradable materials without sacrificing durability for environmental responsibility. Blue View Footwear believes that fashion and sustainability can coexist harmoniously. Just visit bit.ly backslash blueview19 and you'll see the ultimate collaboration of fashion, sustainability, and media excellence. Shaw, it's time for us to discuss the impressment team. These are dudes that are, in the immortal words of of M from James Bond, they impress me. Facts. <laughs> okay. So our our our, our roster um, from back court to front court, we've got Terry Rozier, Kobe White, Derek White, Jaime Vasquez Jr. Jalen Johnson. That's a pretty nice, impressive. This could be a starting five that might not, you know what I'm saying? That could probably win some games if you really think about it. But what is it about these guys that impresses you? 
I think more or less, you know, when I take the landscape of these five guys individually, and yeah, I think if you're going from a starter standpoint, be a little bit undersized. Jalen Johnson, not even play that five role, if you will. Um, but Terry Rogier having a career high in points. Obviously, Lonzo was out, but averaging 24 a game, a seven assists, four, almost four rebounds, just really, really hooping on a bad basketball team. But I think we continue to understand that Rogier is a guy who can really hoop. Um, given the opportunity and may why if we were to go somewhere else, you wouldn't necessarily want him to be your lead guy. But I think in this role, he's really, really been having an amazing season. And it's just kind of gone unnoticed because Charlotte has been so dismal in, in general. Kobe White, we talked about Zach Levine earlier in the, in the show. Kobe White has more or less blossomed in, in, in Zach Levine's absence. Career high, almost 18 a game, five assists, four rebounds, 39% from three. Just really figuring out how to be an NBA pro and impact winning in a way that he hasn't had not had before. There's a lot of him coming into his, into his season, um, his rookie year. And I don't think he delivered and was pressing too hard. The game is clearly slowed down for him now as well, too. What can we say about Derek white? Uh, all-star considerations are being, being, being thrown his way despite Tatum and Brown being there. Derek white, Preparing right, to be one of the more important basketball players in the NBA, and especially on this Boston Celtics team, 17 a game, five assists, and 42% from three, a steal a block. One of the better two way guys out there as well, too. And you can see why they jettisoned Marcus Smart in essence to give Derek White the proverbial keys on this roster. Uh, Hami Hawkins Jr., probably the biggest surprise, I think, in terms of the rookie class. The Miami Heat do it again. Um, had a big 30 and 10 game on Christmas Day, uh, really, really making waves here as the Miami Heat just continue to get guys wherever they are and turn them into valuable basketball players. And finally, Jalen Johnson um, on this Atlanta Hawks team. There was a lot of conversation and I was dead ass wrong. I got to say this here. I thought DeAndre Hunter was finally going to have the breakout year. It was Jalen Johnson was like, no, hold my beer. It's my time. A Hunter we're seeing is injured yet again. And Jalen Johnson coming back from injury um, is now averaging 16 a game, 60% from the floor and 41% from three. Didn't know he'd be able to shoot it like that. Almost three attempts a game. So not super voluminous, but again, three attempts a game, 41%. I think these five guys have had seasons that are, are noteworthy and should be recognized by someone who may not always paying attention. Derek White. You see him because the Boston is doing so good, but some of these other guys on some struggling teams that you may not be paying as close attention to. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, listen, shout out to our man. You know, you're, you're a former young son. Now is a grown man, Terry Rozier, right? Like, yeah. you know, he was so maligned um, and, and you can't blame him because the, the, the Charlotte Hornets offered him the bag. He took it. He probably felt like with what he was contributing and with, you know, what he did for the Boston Celtics, he would have hoped that obviously he would have been able to continue that impressive run with the roster that they had, um, especially being next to Tatum and Brown. But, you know, as as they he 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 bet on himself. Right. And he's had to wait this out. So that the opportunity was there for him to be able to go out there and, you know, show us that he is a capable scorer. He's a he's a capable guard. We've always believed that. Um I don't know if it, on a bigger stage, so to speak, there there is sustainability for what he's doing. But in this moment in time, the opportunity is there. And he's putting himself again back in that position where he should be, you know, in the eyes of a lot of people who are saying that they need a legit, you know, reliable quality guard. Um, and if he continues to shoot the basketball as well as he's been shooting in this in this iteration, this period that he's in right now. I think, you know, you have to start taking a long, hard look with some of these other teams that could be missing that aspect to what is necessary for their team to take a next step. You know what I mean? I don't know if it stays with the Charlotte Hornets. I, I do think that you may have to really can reconsider this, this combination of him and ball and things of that nature. But I just think that only Terry Rozier and what he's contributing to me is so remarkable in that he's been given second life to prove that he is a more than capable guard. You don't have too many of those, you know, when in those conversations, the last time we think we had that, we talked about was what Tyus Jones and, and look what's happened with him. You know what I mean? Like, so I would hope that that's not what happens with Terry Rozier. Cause I do believe that his, as overall, all overall and all around guard play, I think he's much better. And I think he, you know, he's showing that. Yeah. I, again, I'm, I'm a big fan of Terry. So we talk about him a lot, you know, periodically throughout here on the baseline. Uh, and I want to continue to see him thrive and whatever that ultimately looks like. He's a, he's a good individual with a great heart. Um, and has always probably gotten, he got the short end of the stick, I think in Boston ultimately, but now, especially with Lonzo being out, has been able to really showcase his skill set. and whether he's there long-term or not, um, he's a capable scorer, uh, averages 15 or 14 and a half, um, for his career. But at right now, 24 game this year and seven dimes uh, also passing the ball extremely well too. This is the best season from Terry Rozier by far. Absolutely. All right. I want to really quickly talk about 
um, the Derek White situation or conversation. Um, first of all, there's no doubt that he should be in all-star considerations. I, I think that when you look at the total package of what Derek White is doing and how he has helped elevate and stabilize uh, what has always seemed to have been one of the most, I guess, <laughs> um, d d uh, non-stable circumstances has been the backcourt play of the Boston Celtics. It always feels like and seems like the Celtics have been reaching and have been experimenting not just through the years of having uh, Brown and Tatum, but even before that with being able to say, you know, this is what we want. This is how we want things to be reflective of when we think about the Celtics, this iteration of the Celtics way. I, I don't, I agree that Derek White has an all-star case um, and without getting too far into, cause we'll have all-star conversation, you know, at a later date, but I don't see how Boston has a third and fourth all-star. It's difficult. Uh, I know. I know. Yeah. Right. But you know, with Porzingis there as well too, but the, the East, I wouldn't say is necessarily loaded, but there's some guys who are just perennial guys who are going to be there. And you add right. Dame into that, into that situation here now, who's usually in the West, you know, it's makes, it just makes it harder for white there, unless there's a slew of injuries or guys who bow out of the all-star game, but he definitely has a case for it. Hence why we're highlighting him here. So I think again, with, especially with the 42% from three and then the stealing, the stealing a block and just even what he does deflections and just staying in front of his guy on a regular basis. Derek white is a, is a pros pro. And while initially, I think most of the Boston faith were like first round picks for Derek White, that seems to be paying over itself, you know, double time. Um, and, and Celtics, I think, would do that deal 100 times out of 100. Again, it's a long term play that we probably didn't see coming. Maybe the Celtics did see coming. But in the end, you will, to your point, for what the Celtics gave up in order to get what you're getting now at this particular juncture, and it could be that case for the next year or two. Who knows? But that is exactly why you do those type of deals. Yeah. No fear. And that's why it's important to understand, you know, we all, and we all do it and we're going to continue to do it. We're going to judge the deal at the face value when they happen. But when right. you can be reflective and look at it a year, two years down the line and see what happens. Great. Because sometimes not everything, it doesn't give you that immediate gratification um, or even that level of understanding, but this is definitely paid dividends here too, as well. I mean, Derek White, even saving them last year in the Eastern conference finals to even force a game six he's not on the roster, then, you know, who's, who's making that play. So in any event, you know, great, great, great season for him looking to continue to see that happen for him in all capacities, whether he makes the all-star team or not, he's still an all-star regardless. Absolutely, man. Great conversation, Shaw, you know, as always, man. And this is an quote unquote impressive roster that we should, uh, definitely be um, having that conversation with and keeping our eyes on, you know, as the season continues to progress, all of these guys contributing immensely and uh, again, it's why it elevates, you know, more talk uh, of the excitement that people really should have, you know, as we start getting a little bit closer, you know, what I'm saying to th that, that, you know, crunch time, so to speak, yeah. after NBA All-Star Weekend, tread deadline and things of that nature and that push for the play in and, and playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. So hope for our fans and listeners are, have been tuning in. Let us know who you think should be traded. Did we miss anybody who should be on this potential list? And let us know about what you think. Who's your all impressive team to date this far? Guys who have, you know, maybe come out of nowhere or just having career season that you would want to nod. Let us know in our comments below or hit us up on our social media as always, man. But great, great conversation as always, my brother. Couldn't do it without absolutely. you. Absolutely. Once again, for the baseline, Callie Warren Show, we appreciate you guys. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll catch up with you next time.